Statewide broadcasts of Your Legislators are made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org. We welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us for this May program on legislative activity, and we're going to have an opportunity to talk about all the work goings on at the state capitol. I want to remind you uh, that this program belongs to you, and we want to hear from you. This is your opportunity to send your questions in via all the electronic means that will appear on the bottom of your screen, and we'll see that your questions get to our distinguished panel of guests. Uh, this is our second to last program of the year. We will be with you again next week, hopefully to talk about a legislative wrap up. We'll see how that goes. And perhaps one of the things that we'll be talking about tonight is the, what is the likely state of affairs when we gather next Thursday. But uh, enough trouble for the moment. We'll talk further about that as the program unfolds. We begin this week's program as we do each week by introducing our distinguished panel of guests who are going to help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. Um, I do want to make one uh, sort of preliminary um, operational note for all of you uh, who are watching our program live around Minnesota. The House is in the process of voting. Our two House members um, have gamely uh, um, uh, agreed to appear with us tonight, but they may have to at certain points this evening drop off and, uh, and cast votes or otherwise participate in legislative activities. And so um, if uh, people disappear and come back, that's kind of what the uh, routine is all about. And we'll just expect the senators to do their work for them on the program. That's how we're going to do it. That's how we're going to handle this. So let's begin as we do uh, each week by introducing our distinguished panel of guests. And a frequent guest on our program over the years has been Senator Mark Coran. Senator Coran, I'm going to invite you to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, your background, the committees you serve on. Uh, your day job, other personal details you want to share with our extended audience. Um, this is your opportunity. The floor is yours. Introduce yourself to our board, please. Excellent. Thank you. I, again, I'm Senator Mark Coran. I represent Senate District 32, Chisago and Isani counties, about 40 miles north of the state capitol. Um, I've been live uh, mailing address to be City of North Branch with my wife and my oldest granddaughter. Um, three boys, 37, 35, and 33, and uh, six grandchildren now. So a few more grandchildren since the last time I was on. Um, but, but I was also born and raised, I'm a frog towner. So born and raised St. Paul, about five blocks west of the state capitol, raised my kids in the Midway area, and then moved up to this area in about 2007. I currently serve, I'm, I just was elected in my second term, and I currently serve as the chair of, the, of a newly formed Technology and Reform, Government Reform Committee. I'm the Vice Chair of a Aging. I'm also the, on the State uh, Government Elections Finance and Policy Committee. I'm also on the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, both of those last two committees, I'm also serving on the uh, conference committees for those. And then I'm also the Chair of the Legislative Audit Commission and serve on the Subcommittee of Employee Relations. <laughs> so um, it, it fits really well to my background, which was, it, it, before uh, Barry, is that it's been just under 18 years at the Minnesota Department of Revenue with all the state's electronic tax file and payment solutions. I've had a job in the real world um, uh, as well as on this small business. And then the last 19 years, selling business process outsourced solutions into government. So federal level, city, state, and county. So um, it lends very well to serving in this role. So that's it for me. We'll probably have some time to talk about some of those technology uh, issues. Uh, Representative Carly uh, Kotze-Witun, did I pronounce that correctly? How close did I get? Almost. 
Um, oh. Yes, I'm Representative Carly Gatiza Watoon. I represent District 48B, which is um, most of the city of Eden Prairie in the Southwest Metro. And um, I am serving in my second term. I was first elected in 2018, got reelected last year in 2020. And um, currently I serve as the vice chair of the Commerce Committee. I serve on the Early Childhood C Committee, as well as Workforce and uh, Business Development and um, the Subcommittee on Behavioral Health. So um, Representative Jurgens and I actually are on a number of committees together. So, um, I am a mom of four. Um, I grew up in Northeastern Wisconsin. I came to Minnesota for college. My husband and I attended St. Thomas met there and um, that's, you know, the, the rest of there is history, I suppose. Um, we moved out to Eden Prairie after graduation and um, now, now our oldest is seven. We have a six-year-old and almost five-year-old and I just had a baby last summer in, um, in the midst of the pandemic. So um, we are having a lot of fun and um, it's, it's been interesting being a full-time parent as well as full-time legislator during the session here in the special sessions throughout last year. Um, in, amidst this remote work environment. So I'm excited to hear from folks tonight all across the state and just be here to discuss the work that we're doing. I, I certainly don't want to step on anybody's, um, their own uh, high school stories, but I do want to say that uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court went to Eden Prairie High School about 10 years ago, and uh, we made a high school visit there. It was a great visit. We had a great opportunity to interact with the uh, uh, students and teachers at Eden Prairie High School, and uh, we got to hear from my colleague Paul Anderson, now retired, who was born and raised in Eden Prairie when it was essentially, well, to, to hear him talk about it, it was a one-room schoolhouse, and he got there by walking through store storms, you know, um, it was uphill both ways, that kind of thing, so, uh, but it was a great experience, and um, uh, we're delighted you're with us this evening. Um, also joining us is Representative Tony Jurgens. Uh, Representative Jurgens uh, uh, represents the Cottage Grove area. Uh, we, we frequently note that he is a successor to the famous Denny McNamara, who uh, right. represented that district for many years. Uh, to, uh, Representative Jurgens, introduce yourself to our viewers. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Justice. Yeah, I think this is about the third time I've done the program. The first time we've done it on Zoom, but uh, I'm in my third term. I was first elected in 2016. And I do represent uh, District 54B, which is about a third or half to a third of Cottage Grove, uh, all of the city of Hastings, uh, the city of Afton, and a couple of uh, Denmark, a couple of townships, Denmark Township and Neninger Township. Uh, I am a uh, father of two grown daughters. They're both married. Uh, my daughter Tori is married to Tyler. My daughter Alexa is married to Tony, coincidentally. Um, and Tony and Alexa have twin babies that were born in January of last year, just before the pandemic hit. And they were born four months early. So they were teeny tiny, about a pound each. They spent the first four months of their life in the NICU and, and we're fortunate to have them living with us. So I get to be a full-time grandpa and, and play with them and see them every single day. And I, we absolutely love it. It's, a, it's a better than being a parent, I think. I don't know, it's because you're, you're, you've already been through it once as a parent. And then when you get the chance to be a a grandpa, there's there's nothing better than that. Uh, I do serve uh, on the housing committee as well as the uh, early childhood finance and policy committee and the workforce and business development finance and policy committee, the, the last two. As uh, Representative Katiza Watoon said, we serve on those two together. And and uh, I've enjoyed working with uh, Representative Katiza Watoon. Uh, I think that uh, one thing, and, and this show brings it out, I, I think that there's a lot more uh, bipartisanship, a lot more of of members working together with, uh, I mean, even before this show started, there was, it was like the Senate and the House were picking on each other. It wasn't Democrat and Republican, it was the, it was the chambers. So um, I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight and I uh, appreciate you asking me to be here. Um, and as you said, that we may have to duck out here and there for votes on the, on the House floor. Well, uh, we were discussing senatorial privilege and the, the priority of the Senate over the House, but there did seem to be dissenting voices on that. But, but anyway, we'll leave that discussion for another day. Finally, last but certainly not least, uh, I'm delighted to welcome to our program from St. Paul, District 67, Senator Fong Hur, if I pronounced that correctly, or at least I got close. Uh, Senator Hur, you've seen the drill. Tell our viewers a little bit about your story, your, uh, your history, uh, committees you serve on, projects that are of interest to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Uh, and you are right on the dot on my name pronunciation. You know, I, I know my name is even more complicated than some of the uh, European last name, whether it's German or Swede or, uh, you know, uh, Norwegian. <laughs> it's, 
some of them I'm, I'm still hard having hard time pronouncing as I, you know, uh, become accustomed to uh, my country now, you know, the great America here, you know, so, but I, you know, back to me, I, I represent Senate District 67 of East Side St. Paul. And so um, this is where all the political happenings in the days, I'm sure, you know, you probably know Barry, um, you know, El, uh, uh, Governor Anderson are from here, Governor Johnson, you know, are from here is a springboard for political success and uh, is built on the back of immigrants and has been this, the, the boarding path for immigrants community too, you know, looking back to 40s or even 80 years ago, it's, there's used to be, have large Swede uh, community, uh, German you know, community, Italian, um, Jewish, and, and so forth, you know, here. And now um, is the uh, com coming together of uh, immigrants from many parts of the world, from East Africa to Southeast Asia, Asia, Asia you know, to, um, you know, to um, Me Mexico or, you know, um, South America continent and so forth. So it's still a very, very popular place uh, for uh, new Americans coming in and start their, their life here in Minnesota. So uh, I live in Minnesota for 30 years now. And, uh, you know, the first uh, 11 years of my life was uh, born and raised in the country of Laos and Laos uh, fell into uh, a civil war, you know, during the Vietnam War, um, American uh, clandestine operation was happening uh, in my home country. And so after the Vietnam War, uh, we had to leave because of, of uh, the involvement of my people, who is just the Hmong people, uh, being involved as a secret soldier for Americans. So we had to leave our country. And at one point we were facing genocide. And so we then we escaped to Thailand. I lived in refugee camp in Thailand for about a year. And so uh, th that's the first 11 years of my life. The second 10 years was um, moving in, in the Midwest here, up and down from Sioux Falls, South Dakota to Houston, Texas, to Kansas, uh, Kansas City, Kansas. And I graduated from uh, Kansas University of Lawrence, Kansas uh, as a computer programmer. And so my first professional career was a computer programmer. And then I become a video photographer. I tell you that I will, will surprise you with this information. I was a, I transitioned from computer programmer to be a, 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 uh, a video, uh, a cameraman, a video producer. And I worked for uh, TPT at some point during the first Hmong te televised program in the early nineties. And I met you before, a number of times before, before I ran for Senate. And as oh, sure. one thing that surprised you is that I was a crew on your show for a couple episodes. So this is not the first time. And I know your crew, number of them quite well. I, I, I talked to you before the show, but I want to leave this as a surprise to you that Very I good. have been at SPNN operating your camera, operating your switcher, <laughs> and even sometimes take callers question questions and uh, pass it to you. So I, I, I know how video production work. That's where my bread and butter come from. And uh, I learned a lot watching, you know, uh, political television uh, programming like yours or Almanacs that helped me understand the landscape of Minnesota, understand the history of Minnesota, the culture of Minnesota, and the po politic too. Although my background is not from uh, uh, from politic, um, but um, I, I, I pride on volunteerism and community involvement and what motivated me to run for the first time in 2012 was uh, because of the diversity here in my district. And I felt that I'm um, very multicultural oriented and can get to know or uh, get, get people from different cultures felt that I uh, could represent them well. And so diversity and equity was the, uh, the key motivation for me to run an office uh, in 2012. I, I, I am serving my third term right now. Uh, and the committee that I am, am in are veteran and military affairs, uh, job and economic development, uh, environmental policy and legacy finance. And I'm also the chair of St. Paul, Dele the, our St. Paul delegation and an assistant minority leader uh, during this biennium. So um, 
Yep, so that's pretty much, I trying to sum as, up as much as I can. So thank you. Well, so that was a that was a great uh, that was a great story, Senator Hearn. You did you did kind of alert me that you were going to drop something on us, and there you go, you did just that. Um, I just don't want to say a word about the immigrant experience. Uh, we all have immigrant stories to tell, um, but just very briefly, uh, for many years when I was a practicing lawyer, uh, I represented a number of Hungarian immigrants who left after the 1956 Hungarian Revolution um, under circumstances pretty similar to, to, to yours in terms of uh, their lives were threatened, settled in this country. And um, at least some of them are watching this evening because they periodically uh, critique my performance. Anyway, let's move on and we will get to the issues of the day. Let's begin with uh, an opportunity to talk about an issue uh, that we have not uh, spent a great deal of time on uh, over the last weeks. Uh, and that's this question of early childhood education, pre-K education. Let's start with you, Representative Jurgens. We'll do the House first, and then we'll move to the Senate. But uh, Representative Jurgens, maybe you could kick us off talking about that um, issue to start with, and then we'll go to uh, Representative Kotsi uh, Witun. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I'm on the Early Childhood Committee, and, and that's something that I was very happy to be a part of. My my youngest daughter is a, uh, works in the child care profession, and and now having the two grandbabies that I uh, mentioned earlier, it, it's you know, the, the sooner that we can reach the, the young learners, um, the, the, the better that they're gonna be um, as, as life goes on. So um, I, was, um, I, I was real proud of the work that we did in that committee. It was very bipartisan. Um, Chair Pinto was um, always open to listening to um, issues that, or uh, bills that, that Republicans had to offer. So um, I, I just think that you know, the, the young children are our future. So the, the uh, getting them at an early age, um, sometimes even, even prenatally to make sure that their the mothers are healthy during their pregnancies, that all goes to help the children as they grow and develop. Um, I, and I've, I've seen, as I mentioned with my grandchildren, they were the twins that were born so early. Um, and, and really what they needed was more time and to be able to, to watch that growth um, in the outside world instead of in their mother where they were supposed to be, it really is, you know, watching that development is, uh, it's just, to me, it was a, it was a miracle to, to watch them and, and to see how far that they've come in uh, just over a year to now to look at them, you, you'd never know what they, where they started their life. Um, they're just happy, normal um, toddlers or near, nearly toddlers are crawling and almost ready to walk. So um, I just think that, and, and our family, we're very fortunate that we were able to take care of them. And, and so the more that we can do to, to make sure that, that others have that same opportunity, I think that um, as a state, that's what we, um, you know, that, that's one of our core values, I think, is to be able to take care of the children um, starting at the very young age. Representative Kotsi Watun, what, what, uh, what's happening on that issue in the legislature these days? Thank you, Barry. Um, I appreciate the question and starting off with early childhood education is always an awesome way to start and it's the best place to start in my opinion. Um, I think you're gonna get my name right by the end of the show. It's Katiza Watun. <laughs> and um, so yes, my first session in the Minnesota House um, back in 2019-2020, uh, I was actually served as the vice chair of the early childhood subdivision. And so this year we were our very own committee, which was super exciting. And um, I think that, you know, we, we covered, um, just like Representative Jurgens just mentioned, so many important topics. And we really dove deep into uh, the brain science. And as, you know, as children are um, growing in, um, in the womb and then kind of as they come out, how quickly their, their brain is developing and just how we can best support them. And um, so there's a lot of science now that's showing that uh, children who go through trauma, um, even prenatally, that, that impacts their brain development. And so uh, making sure that we're supporting families and particularly mothers um, as they are pregnant and making sure that they have access to medical services. Um, you know, there's also some additional research that's come out more recently about the um, maternal mortality rate between Caucasian women and black women and indigenous women. And, um, and just really focusing on that and addressing that so that um, when babies are developing and then they're born, um, we, can, we can address all of those challenges that may come. Um, Representative Jurgens and I actually um, are sponsoring a bill on early childhood scholarships. 
to make sure that we are uh, supporting the families who need the support in order to get their children into high quality early learning programs. Um, and so just making sure that people have the, the support that they need because we know all Minnesota kids deserve a great start to life and it just isn't possible right now. I mean, the, the cost of um, childcare really, uh, really makes it uh, difficult for providers and um, and staff to continue on in that um, in that career, and so we'd really like to support those folks, um, small business owners, uh, people, early childhood educators who want to continue down that path. But then, of course, our youngest families in Minnesota, the the, the uh, finances don't really match up because oftentimes when you're a parent, you're at the lowest earning potential of your whole career because families or parents typically have their family or start their family earlier on in their career. And um, so that's, it just really poses a financial challenge. So I really believe that the state needs to step up and support that so that we can address some of the challenges that, that continue to pop up and, and drag on um, toward the, um, the, uh, the um, achievement gap that we have here in Minnesota. Senator Corrin, let's talk about this issue uh, on the Senate side. Um, um, Pre-K, uh, early childhood education, what, what's going on in the Senate side? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think you'll see in, in the, on the Senate side, of course, pre-K is is an important uh, and, a, and a continued and ongoing battle. Where do those where do where does that responsibility lie? Is it you know there's a massive push push this into the public education system, which to me is a is a large you know I'm also not in favor of large corporate uh, daycare providers and facilities as well. I think the the greatest challenge that we've we've had is trying to focus so we can rebuild those family daycares smaller family units, smaller daycares where the kids get much greater attention to provide that healthy environment where they can grow. We do know that the first five years of a child's life is absolutely critical. It's foundational to their entire future. And, and so we need to make sure that um, families have the support, um, that those children have support and that, that they're prepared for school when they enter. I think the greatest challenge, you know, for me, it's the benefit of growing up in, in St. Paul, Minneapolis and, and doing the work when we talk about the largest disparities in the country in right in, in black and brown families, which is atrocious and shouldn't be acceptable. We always get a lot of heat about, you know, changing policies or setting direction and going and taking a new path. Um, because the current path that we've led on or that we've been led to has put us in this position where it's the worst ever. So I think it's really about supporting those families and making sure we have accountability. And, and I don't know about you guys, Barry, if you guys, I, I participated in, in, in uh, was that the, all the viewings of the, uh, um, the Lucy Laney story? I think every single one of our legislators should watch that story, the documentary done by Gary Levin, and it really talks about the plight of a family, the lowest performing school in, in, the, in the state, and what the principal did to kind of turn that around. It's finding that one person who cares, how do we wrap an envelope around the child to make sure that they have one person who cares because in that school, when you think about it, the child at five years old, they know that they're their last hope for the opportunity for prosperity or to achieve the opportunity that is provided in this country. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm all about making sure that we go, and I think the Senate, you'll see in the focus, um, we look at early childhood scholarships, but also that is, is school education scholarships. Kids in today, I think, I think over 74% of both Hispanic and Black families want school choice. And that starts at the youngest ages and make sure that they have the opportunity to attend great schools and uh, take advantage of the opportunity that's available. I'm also, you know, when you get into early, early childhood, um, uh, we'll do whatever it takes, I think, to, uh, to try and find and, and get those families and the structures around those children for the first five years, just for the foundation. And then we need to make sure our schools perform better, um, you know, for K through 12, so. Senator Hur, your lots thoughts. Of, lots of controversy on that topic. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, yeah. Good. it's great. Senator Hur. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Barry. And I think my colleagues already explained um, and quite a bit about the um, what's involved legislation that's involved in early education. I do look at life as a, a four-year block or five-year block in life. Um, you know, the, in, 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 uh, in four years, a newborn will go to preschool. And in four years, you know, the kindergarten, you know, will, you know, lead on to um, sixth grade and become junior high. And in four years, a junior high they will, you know, go to high school. In four years, they'll be uh, going to higher learning or 
uh, you know, go, uh, go to transition to our workforce. And so it's important for us to focus on the first four years of a child's life uh, because that stage, the um, idea, the vision of uh, the growth of anyone, I think, you know, and these days is even more important with the fast moving technology kids today, I, I can imagine learn much faster than our generation does, you know, and as we, we look at into our life, whatever happened to us at younger age, that, that shape us, that's shape us a who very much of who we are today. And our current legislation, you know, uh, we can, we can broaden and detail to what, whatever uh, ramification it has, but it needs to have funding. And funding is important. You know, we cannot have a zero, um, a zero target for education, you know, with inflation continue to increase, you know, with 2% inflation for our K-12, and we need to do better. Uh, we can say all we want about, you know, providing needs and education, have a plan, but if there's no dollars, you know, it, we cannot go anywhere because, you know, it takes, it takes money as a force for our uh, society, you know, here in America. So uh, that's as what I want to uh, state out there. Um, all, although we are getting uh, funding from the federal, the American Rescue, Ag American Res Rescue Plan, and I rather that we don't um, mix that together, you know, but just work on the, the uh, budget that we already have in plan uh, to put for, forward and, uh, you, you know, well plan out what the dollars from the federal could be used for other means that we uh, we really need during this time after we, uh, since that we are transitioned from uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I think that the bottom line is we need to have dollars to, uh, to improve our early uh, education at the moment. So let's uh, touch on it. You touched on an issue, Senator, that, um, that I think we should probably invite our panel to discuss. Covered in the newspaper today a little bit, uh, about a difference of opinion between the Republican majority in the Senate uh, and uh, the Democrat majority in the House having to do with uh, higher education funding, potentially using some federal dollars that come from uh, the Relief Act, um, and then um, reducing um, uh, tuition, uh, tuition levels uh, for uh, state colleges. So Senator Corn, let's, uh, let's start with you. Maybe you could talk about that issue briefly. We'll go to, uh, to Senator um, uh, Her and then go to the House. But let's, let's get the, because uh, I understand there's probably a difference of opinion even on the Senate side, but, but let's at least get the issue out there and let, let's talk about it. Senator? Yeah, so, you know, of course, our, our entire goal has been to, to keep the uh, higher education, the uh, increase, rate of increase um, at, a, at the lowest rate as possible. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't served on, and we haven't done many, uh, um, we haven't done much on the, on the higher education side. But if you look at the, um, you know, we're looking at some of the federal dollars to buy down short term. We know that that will take care of um, some short term. Um, and I think the key is, is, you know, continued push at reform or to push our institutions. You know, I think we discovered in the last legislative session, our online learning, um, our institutions were charging more for online learning than they were for in-person learning. And so you'll see a continued push to, to, to provide a more effective and more efficient uh, higher education system just all throughout. Um, our system. It's all government and it doesn't have many pressures that keeps it contained or pushes for efficiency. And you know, that's one of my overall goals, um, regardless of the agency. I think we, we, we haven't focused on where it has no pressures in the market to, uh, for it to change its business model. And we continue to see exponential growth in cost and uh, reduced outcomes in, across the board. So. Um, I'll, I'll let Fong cover uh, cover the rest from his perspective as well. Uh, Senator Hur, the floor is yours. Well, I think that right now our state um, have a positive surplus of 1.6 billion dollars, and uh, you know we should uh, wisely use that, you know, and don't get don't let get confused with our 
federal rescue plan dollars, you know, and uh, those are set to uh, for rescue rescue plan to to build build American back better. And so, uh, although at one some point and in the immediate uh, month or so, we will have to come out with legislation to better use of those dollars. But you know, I said stay with stay with our original intent and push a, a good target, put a target dollars in place, uh, which we are don't have it right now in the various committee that we are moving forward for the last couple, couple of days of the uh, 2021 session. And so I think uh, um, number one is put a target in place first. And for higher learning, you know, and we, that, that interconnect with what you say earlier about the early education and then uh, higher learning, we need to help uh, promote or help uh, engage uh, people of color uh, to move forward for young people, graduates, the high school graduate from uh, the urban core, uh, people that I represent to have opportunity to uh, go to college, you know, uh, whether it's uh, two years college or, you know, four years, you know, university program at the same time, create a pipeline for them to um, have internship in uh, our technology industry, whether that's agricultural industry or whether that's um, you know um, coding industry, science and uh, industry. So I think that will be one way so that when they finish colleges, they could be ready on a get go for a well paid job, and perhaps yeah, they will have the means to turn around and, and help other people along the way uh, and be a productive citizen for our society. Uh, Representative uh, Cotes Watoon, can you uh, talk a little bit about this uh, issue of higher education funding and uh, this uh, difference of opinion about uh, perhaps how to use the, uh, the uh, money from the feds? Certainly. Um, so I, that's the other end of the spectrum from the, um, on the education th um, per spectrum that I, that I work on, obviously with a focus on early education, but it is, it's really important because, you know, we're, we are hoping to support our students from cradle all the way through career so that they can make it through the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and, and thrive in their life beyond. So um, when we're looking at helping um, every Minnesota student achieve their dreams, there's a lot that we do need to do because um, I don't serve on the higher education committee. I'm not certain on all the kind of the, the nitty gritty about the federal funding and what what uh, folks are looking to do as far as um, tuition freezes or, or um, lowering tuition. But um, I think that what what um, particularly is important to me is some of the investments that um, we made in our house um, higher education omnibus bill, making sure that um, our students of color and um, indigenous um, have access to grants so that they can kind of continue um, increasing the diversity in the classroom. So if, if, if education is their passion, making sure that we support them in, in doing that. And so I know that there was um, some funding that we had set aside um, and I'm not sure where the conversations are going on that in conference committee quite yet, but um, I, I think that it's, um, it has a lot of potential to, um, to allow our colleges um, to kind of help those, those students get where they're going. And then in return, um, obviously help out our younger students in Minnesota as they continue on through their career, their education career. Representative Jurgens, higher education, rescue. No, I, I think we're on the precipice of a of, of change in how the higher education is going to be delivered. I mean, look at our, how we've adjusted tonight, and we're, we're conducting this over Zoom instead of in person. Uh, colleges, universities, technical schools, um, as well as our, as our K through 12, have, we're forced into a, a new way of delivering education. And even once this pandemic gets behind us, um, I think that we're gonna see how maybe the investments in bricks and mortar at our campuses aren't quite as important as they were before. Maybe we need to invest more in technology so that we can um, deliver education in a different format. Uh, and one thing that I've noticed since I got in here, I'm in my third term, is more of a, a focus on not so much on the four-year college degrees, although that still fits for uh, many of our students, but it doesn't fit for everybody. And, and more of an emphasis on the two-year technical schools 
whether it's nursing, whether it's accounting, whether it's um, you know uh, camera operating or or whatever uh, technical field people want to go into, the trades absolutely, electricians and and uh, you, you're seeing those needs out in our uh, workforce today. And, and so I think that as kids are going through the high school years, um, that they look to their options in postgraduate. And for some, it's gonna be military. For some of it will be a four-year degree. But boy, there's a, there's a lot of careers in, that uh, can be um, studied for the, for the two-year, uh, in the two-year technical colleges. So I think we're, we're as in, in the coming years, we're gonna see how that education system is delivering um, the, the services. And I think we're gonna see a little, bit of a, a little bit of a change. So we have a question from a viewer who wants to talk about the transportation budget, what that's gonna look like, um, uh, the move to electric vehicles, which reduces the uh, amount of money available to um, uh, transportation because of course there's no gas tax involved. Um, there's just a whole variety of issues that go with transportation, but uh, I think we'll give our panel an opportunity to deal with that question generally. We'll see where it takes us. Let's start with you, Representative uh, Kutiz Watun. Uh, the floor is yours to talk a little bit about transportation issues. I suppose I should at least note that uh, um, Highway 212 and, and uh, it go, kind of goes through your uh, Eden Prairie area. Those of us who are driving from Apple Valley to Hutchinson very much appreciate the improvements that have been made there. And if you wanted to go ahead and finish that 212, we'd be all in favor of that. Anyway, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, I actually live very near to Highway 212. So that's uh, that's my um, on-ramp uh, to head to the Capitol in St. Paul too. So um, I can certainly appreciate that. And uh, my husband and I moved out to Eden Prairie just after they completed the 494-169 interchange. Um, that used to be a stoplight for, for those of you who don't make it out to the southwest side of the metro very often. And it's hard to believe that there was a stoplight on and off of 494 um, directly at, uh, at 169. So um, we've made a lot of improvements over here in the southwest metro and um, certainly not discounting the construction going on with the um, the Green Line extension, the Southwest Light Rail. So I know um, folks are really excited about that. When I was out door knocking in 2018, I heard from a lot of folks, particularly our seniors out here in Eden Prairie, who are really looking forward to um, being able to access uh, the, the amenities of downtown Minneapolis, whether that's um, going to watch some of the athletic teams play, whether that is going out to eat um, or to the museums and, and all of that. And um, as, as you know, they, they were sharing with me as they age, they're just less and less comfortable driving downtown. And um, so certainly things have changed over the last year with um, people not, not uh, heading downtown as much when we're um, staying home, we're getting takeout, all of those sorts of things. But I think that um, as, as we continue to rebound from COVID here and people get back to uh, life as it was, um, I think that's something that I know is going to make a huge difference in our community, as well as pulling um, pulling folks who are employed with some of the, the employers that are out here in Eden Prairie, Minnetonka area, um, United Health Group, um, contributing part of their um, property to, to um, have one of the um, stops nearby so that their employees can commute either from Minneapolis or um, head, head downtown for, for some of those culturally re related issues. Um, regarding electric vehicles, um, I think that that's something that we do. We have so many more discussions coming. I'm, I continue to be um, intrigued um, by uh, the development of all the car manufacturers. I mean, kind of moving moving in that direction. And I think um, that we we have a lot of uh, discussions yet to have um, to see how we, how we will be able to move forward here in Minnesota. But I think it's really important that we do what we can um, when you know, uh, to support folks who want to get into an electric vehicle so that um, we can we can um, lower those carbon emissions and, and as, a, as a state, but individually too. I mean, there's, um, there's every, you know, incremental changes that we can all make. And I think sometimes people feel like, oh, well, you know, maybe I can't afford an electric vehicle or, um, you know, I, I don't know how to do backyard compost. Well, it's not every person doing everything perfectly, right? When we're trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and and really um, roll back some of the, the um, difficulties that we that we are looking out on um, when we look at environmental and, and transportation um, uh, issues. It's just that we all do what we can. And so I think make, continuing to educate people, making sure that um, people learn a little bit more, um, that they have access to vehicles that are going to um, contribute, that we um, then, you know, look at solar and, and kind of all of the um, spinoffs from, from there so that everybody can make the contribution that they're able to. And then we are uh, moving in the right direction. 
Uh, Senator Corn, let's talk a little bit about transportation issues from the Senate perspective. What, uh, so, what do you see? So from the Senate perspective, uh, our, our bill this year, we're focused on probably the largest spending that we put in since uh, 2008 in roads and bridges, focusing on true core infrastructure projects um, without uh, an increase in gas tax. I think there was one proposal too to, to uh, cover electronic vehicle or electric vehicles um, from a tax perspective. I think they would pay a nominal fee today. And uh, there's been a significant resistance for the, those who drive electric vehicles um, to um, pay for their fair share of the uh, road gas taxes or the road fee to use taxes. And so I think you know, that, that's been an ongoing battle. Um, we also move, I think in our bill this year, if you remember, I think in 2017 or I think 2017, we moved um, uh, the half, half the sales tax, I think about $300 million from auto parts um, sales taxes into roads and bridges. I think in our bill this year, we move another, the other half, another 25%. So another almost $200 million into roads and bridges to get all those vehicle related taxes focused on supporting the infrastructure for roads and vehicles. Um, yeah, as you know, we also have a couple of challenges with, uh, with um, the light rail. So light rail itself, I think uh, uh, Representative talked about, yep, the, the need for to get to Minneapolis, if, if we can get a safe public transportation system that people will use, um, we're all for it, right? We believe in a full public transportation system. Today, I think we're having challenges. You'll see in our bill, I think we have to address finally the um, North Star light rail that goes up to uh, Big Lake. In its best days, which a lot of that's driven solely by sports, not daily commuters, on the best days it had, we were, we were subsidizing each trip by about $19. Today, the subsidy is about $400 a trip. So uh, in its best days, we could lease everybody brand new Cadillacs in lieu of that subsidy. Today, we could lease everybody a brand new Cadillac based on the daily subsidy per rider. The, the long-term forecast for that is pretty troubling with the uh, lack of safety and security in, in, the, in the metro. And will people come back? So it was, there was true commuters using it. Um, but with you see the, the great reduction in the workforce that's going to return to the Minneapolis and, and the metro area um, from a remote perspective, it's going to be a challenge. When you get into electric car, I think you, there's a pretty big divide about moving to the California um, vehicle standards for Minnesota, very different climates. Um, I think we're all, I think the manufacturers have been doing a great job. We all want great, high quality, um, really efficient and clean vehicles. I think the industry has been moving very quickly. Um, we don't believe that we should be forcing people or forcing manufacturers to hypothetically sell more of a certain vehicle over another. Uh, I think Senator Osmick uh, did the math on what the forecasted reduction of uh, CO2 would be for the um, implementation of the California standards. I think it was eight tenths of 1% um, over, over many years um, in the reduction in those emissions. Our vehicles have become cleaner and, and every day. And so the air is cleaner, the cars are more efficient. And I think the one piece that people aren't talking about is our, our electrical grid and infrastructure wouldn't support 10% of us owning electric vehicles and putting that charging demand into our residential neighborhoods. So there's a significant need and upgrade. And I think it's occurring, but it's just not gonna be a place where we have to mandate it. It's moving along just fine the way it is. And at the end of the day, it will make incremental, if no change at all in the air we breathe, and we all believe in clean air and clean water, um, but it will just increase the cost unnecessarily to all of the other vehicles and the cost to running a, a motor vehicle dealership. Part of the, our vehicles are part of our longstanding American culture of freedom to move about and the luxury to move about and the autonomy to move about um, is our automobiles. It's unique, maybe unique to, to America, but it's, uh, it's one of those things that's been longstanding. But I think the energy part of it is equally as challenging to make sure that we have a grid that can support the number of vehicles, not just in the charging station and the convenience of it, but in the homes, they have a tr it's a significant demand. Um, and, and that'll happen over time, but we couldn't support 10% today and it'll take a long time for, before we can, so. Senator Lee, your so. thoughts on, uh, Senator Lee, I'm sorry, Senator Hurd, your thoughts on the, uh, on the transportation issues? 
Yes, uh, I'm not in the transportation committee, but uh, I know well when I hit potholes here in the East Side St. Paul and there's plenty of potholes. And I thought that my district has the most potholes, but when I complained to the city, they said, no, there's other part too in the city and also Rochester too, you know, other metro city, Minneapolis as well. And so how are we gonna fix that? Uh, we need to have, a, uh, we need to appropriate enough dollars. And I think that uh, the half cent sell tax will be, you know, a, uh, you know, strong, strong um, uh, sense for us, a responsible uh, way for us to cover, you know, our, our roads and bridges and improve, you know, our potholes. And I remember a couple of years ago when we gray our potholes and our roads and bridges, we're at a, a D minus, I, I believe, I, you know, if my memory uh, proves me right. So, you know, I'm a, a supporter of the half cent self tax. And when it comes to, uh, you know, electric car, I think that it's time now for us to push that out. You know, even our manufacturers, uh, uh, GM and Ford, they, they are waiting. They are waiting for us to approve. You know, I know that uh, the California plan has been talked about, but we're not California, we're Minnesota. Um, we're Minnesota and we're Minnesota. And I think we're going to be more responsive, we're more responsible for our clean air as well as clean water. And it's more importantly for um, uh, people in my district, especially with the air pollution, with the uh, traffic that coming through, you know, um, the, the, the air quality that you live and where you live matters, you know, it, it does impact your health. Uh, and um, community of low income don't have the means to move to other place where they can find a cleaner air refuge in our other part of our state. So we are here where, where we has to be. And so I think the uh, moving to e-car e uh, car will be a better solution uh, for our state as we decide with this legislation uh, or maybe next year, but I prefer that we don't put e-car as a whole or put other funding on whole uh, based on e-car. So um, uh, that would be my answer. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Representative Jurgens, transportation issues. Well, I know that the question was broader than this, but so, but I just have to say one of the, the very first issues that I got involved with, in fact, before I was elected my first term, when I was door knocking along Highway 316 in Hastings, I had people telling me, this is a dangerous road. If you get elected, what are you going to do here? And uh, once I got elected, the first thing I saw was MnDOT was going to raise the speed limit on that road from 35 miles an hour to 45. I didn't know anything about how this whole Legislature, legislature work, um, but I got involved and, and was able to uh, work with MnDOT on a long-term plan. And long story short, five years later on Monday, they're breaking ground on a completely redeveloped uh, one mile stretch of Highway 316 through Hastings. So these things take time um, and they're not cheap either. We ended up, uh, we were able to get some bonding dollars in last year's bonding bill to help finish that off. Um, but that's, that's uh, it's gonna be, uh, once the construction is done, it's going to be a safer roadway. Uh, it's going to have easier access. Uh, it's going to reduce the speeds for the residents that live there. So all in all, I think everybody, it's going to be very satisfying. Now, bigger uh, picture from a transportation standpoint, um, as you know, we, we get the funding now for roads and bridges through the motor vehicle sales tax, um, the gas tax, and the license tabs primarily. And, and as Senator Coran said in, the, in recent years too, with the uh, sales tax on auto parts. Um, I, I think that we all perhaps agree that one of the greatest um, functions of government is to provide roads and bridges as part of the infrastructure. Uh, and I think that as a state, we've done a, a, a pretty good job of that. I mean, um, yeah, there's still a lot of potholes like uh, Senator Hur has talked about, and that's always frustrating. Uh, but man, look at some of the roads that we drive on right now. Um, the, the new freeway systems, the new highways, the interchanges, it's constantly, you know, there's uh, two seasons in, in Minnesota, winter and road construction. And I think that now they, they continue with the road construction through the winters too. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, a, a, a long-term approach is, um, is always what's needed. As far as the electric vehicles, I think that's something best left to the, to the marketplace to determine. I think that uh, we're seeing more and more electric vehicles that are available. 
and that's based on the demand. As more and more people want the uh, electric vehicles, more and more will be supplied. If we do um, the, the California standards, like uh, uh, Senator Coran mentioned, I've talked to auto dealers in my district and how that would harm them. You know, we're right, right next to Wisconsin. And with those mandates on the Minnesota auto dealers, people are just gonna go across the, the road to Hudson or to Prescott to buy their vehicles. And that's gonna harm the, the auto sales in, in especially in the border communities. So um, that's something that I would, I think that we should shy away from as well. Um, but uh, I guess that, that, that's what I have on that topic. So um, Representative um, uh, Cotiza Watoon, I, I wanted to talk to you. We're, we're gonna start talking about the bonding bill, but before we get to that, we, we want one quick follow-up on the transportation piece. Um, has there been any discussion about uh, completing the 212, um, you know, um, four lane through uh, out, to, uh, uh, out to the Glencoe area? That's a really great question. Um, I have not been a part of any of those discussions at this point in time, um, but I, I'd be happy to circle, circle back with um, uh, Representative Cagle um, and uh, Chair Hornstein and, and see if that has been um, a point of discussion at all. Because I know, I, I'm sure that um, as, as people kind of do continue that commute, there is a point um, where, where it, yes, it definitely slows down. And I know um, Highway 5 is also kind of that, that, uh, that same yeah, challenge same people come in from, from the West. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's go to the bonding bill. Earlier in the program this year, we had some discussion with members of the legislature about uh, the possibility of a bonding bill. Everyone seems to think that there will be one. Um, discussion of it uh, seems to have largely died away, but I'm just wondering if you're hearing anything about uh, what a bonding bill might look like, uh, what the size of it might be, um, and uh, the kinds of projects that might be included. So let's start with you on that question. Oh, thank you. So uh, I know that um, Chair Lee in the House has been really open um, with members as far as being able to kind of set up one-on-one um, -on -one to kind of talk about any projects that are high priorities in their district as they can kind of continue the, the discussion on that. Um, I'm not sure um, certainly where, where things will go with our budget targets over the, over the next few days here and what things may look like. But um, I know that you know it, it's really important that we do continue to invest in the statewide infrastructure. Um, right now, we don't have any projects that um, that my, my district has uh, requested, but we are kind of a part of um, one of the public safety training facilities that was gonna be a regional center that actually located across the district border in Edina. Um, but that was something that was um, previously um, uh, a part of um, a, a bonding proposal. And so I'm hopeful that um, we're, we'll be able to continue investing in, um, in that project and then and, and so many others that are, that are really worthy of, of that conversation. Representative Jurgens, your thought on uh, the bonding uh, on a bonding bill and what the amount might be and the likelihood and all of that. Well, you know, this session, our number one priority is to pass a budget, and here we are, three days to the end of the constitutional end of session, and in the House we have passed zero budget bills, none. Um, there doesn't appear to be any urgency uh, amongst the, the leadership. It's like we are we are expecting to come back for a special session in June for the governor's emergency powers. So let's just finish the budget then. Um, that's really our top priority. And any talk of a budget of a bonding bill before we get the budget done is premature. That's the dessert after the meal, and we haven't even gotten close to addressing the meal yet. If we get to that point uh, on non-typical bonding years, um, the average is about two hundred fifty million dollars, and it's very heavy on infrastructure on wastewater treatment plants and, and flood hazard mitigation and transportation and those things. So if we get that far, I think that that's the, um, the direction that the bonding bill would need to go. But in my opinion, uh, I know that there's some, some appetite for it, but we're just so far away from it. We have to get the budget done first. And, and here we are three days to the end of session and, and uh, uh, Representative Katiza Watoon and I are, have one ear to the, what's going on on the House floor. Uh, House File 600, the the metal or the uh, recreational marijuana bill, uh, we're spending hours on that when we don't have budget bills yet. So I think talk of a of a bonding bill at this point um, is premature. We have to get the we have to get the budget done first. We have a couple of minutes left, Senator. Um, her uh, bonding bill, very quickly, and budget issues. If you want to touch touch on that as well. Yeah, I you know uh, I'd like to encourage. Um, that we find some way to uh, go ahead with the bonding project. And I know that um, from what I heard from Representative 
uh, uh, colleague Cody, um, you know, uh, and I know that Representative Lee in the House is working very hard on uh, getting project lined up, but, um, you know, I can't say much. And the, uh, the body that I represent, which is the Senate, and I like to um, encourage our leadership to think about that and open uh, for discussion and trying to see if we can quickly get some um, bonding uh, project going. Um, you know, I noticed that this year, uh, the governor appropriated some dollars and also in the house language for uh, equity project, project that uh, support uh, uh, cultural communities, uh, people of color, like in my district alone, there's the Wonka TP uh, Center as a uh, Lakota, you know, uh, sacred uh, ground and then they're opening up a interpreted center and they need funding for that as well as uh, 30,000 feet um, a, a organization uh, uh, hoping to build a facility to improve the lives of young African Americans and so um, I hope I'm hopeful that by in the next few days or maybe in during special session We'll pass a, a Senator Kerr, Senator Corn. I'm going to give you just about 15 seconds bonding bill. Do you think we get one? Uh, I don't. I think what you'll see is I think the budget is a top priority, but I think you'll see blended within our our budget, uh, the actual budget, is the uh, federal recovery dollars um, put into those infrastructure, roads, bridges, and wastewater. So I think you'll right, see point, we're done that for investment. The I want to, I want to thank our panel uh, for joining us. One last program next Thursday night. We hope to see you. Send your questions in between now and then. We see that we'll see that they get to the panel. Thank you and good night. Thank you. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org.